Very good. So we start again, and uh, I will ask now uh, Maria Bartolomei to give her to give us uh, her presentation. Thank you. You have the floor. Okay, could you give her the microphone yeah. as well? Okay. <clears throat> Good morning to you all, and thank you very much to Professor Toniatti for the invitation. I am a lawyer with a PhD in sociology of law, who is spending his life in doing anthropological field work more than 20 years. My field of interests include legal pluralism, gender roles, and the human rights. Currently, I'm working to try to situate the understanding of cultural relativism within a broader framework of social and legal justice. In our complex world of cultural differences, conflicts, competition, and seemingly relentless globalization, the concept of citizenship, equality, social justice, and minorities' rights are becoming topics of pressing concerns. So today, I would like to draw your attention to the important role which anthropology of law can play in the understanding of the current dynamics of law and society, and consequently in developing our ability to achieve workable legal solutions in maintaining not only the so-called globalization of law, but also the issue of law under globalization, that is law operating at a lo local level, and it's more and more recurring task of adapting domestic legal culture to the new variety of rising rights, claims, and demands. Legal anthropology, as you know, looks at law from a cross-cultural comparative perspective. In a so-called balance of reciprocity, it considers law as integral to culture and culture as integral to law. Traditionally, it focuses primarily on unwritten law, especially in non-Western or post colonial traditional or customary context. The law-custom distinction, once central to debates on legal pluralism, is now replaced by the study of different forms of pluralism incorporated in global and local legal orders of Western postmodern societies. If by now it is no mystery that law is part of culture, yet it is now not uncommon for those who are deeply involved in a given legal system to act as if the law is quite separable from other elements of cultural life. In so doing, they, either researchers, jurists, policy makers, or lay people, forget that to the legitimacy of law and its capacity to respond to change, various beliefs, discourses, both narratives and codified law, and practices are indis indispensable. For this reason, I will try and discuss a few different case studies which, in spite of their diversity, present many similarities concerning the inextricable entanglement between law and culture, and the importance of studying individual legal institutions in the context of their particular cultural settings. Before starting with my collection of case studies, let me insist on the concern that the globalization of law does not just imply a process of homogenization and integration, but involves a proliferation of diversity as well. On the one hand, nowadays international migrations are certainly once, uh, one, sorry, one of the major source of social legal change and one of the most important subjects of both public and academic <laughs> debates. While moving across national borders, indeed, the migrants are bringing their archetypal culture and their religious, political, and juridical thinking into their new countries of residence. Furthermore, their ethnic and religious communities are increasingly claiming normative effects of their own rules within states' legal systems. On the other hand, as a matter of fact, the law is unable to completely direct, run, and control these big changes and challenges. So current European, as well as Italian legal culture, experiences and suffers from the traits of complexity, fragmentation, and contingency. 
The increasing multiplicity of different sources of law is bringing about the chaotic coexistence of different legal traditions within the same legal order, be it a nation state or an international or a supranational jurisdiction. As a result, scholars in legal culture and policy makers necessarily deal with a plurality of pluralisms, including the emergence and or the revival of some forms of personal law. As we all know, a personal law system is a legal system in which laws or legal norms deal with different people differently. Accordingly, people's religion, people's religion, race or nationality determines which law will be applied to them. Oh, sorry. Ah, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, different, different, what type of, okay, personal law system. Personal, I, I was saying, um, personal law system is a legal system in which laws or legal norms deal with different people differently. Accordingly, people's religion, race, or nationality determines which law will be applied to them. Under this kind of legal system, law attaches to people, and as they move from one location or territory to another, the same law will apply to them. The legal framework, the legal framework of personal law is clearly historically and culturally quite far from contemporary European legal system that are founded instead on a claim of exclusivity of state-made law and on an individualistic conception of rights. Here, citizenship ensures the principle of equality among citi all citizens and founds the collective legal dimension that requires almost no further reference to any other source of law. Particularly for this reason, many Italian jurists, no, we are here. Many Italian jurists consider personal law as something belonging to the past, discriminatory, discriminatory and illiberal, a sort of embarrassing anachronism in a modern world of constitutional egalitarianism and certain territorial legal regimes. Consequently, people who live under personal law are often perceived to be both pre-modern and non-Western. Although such a viewpoint is undoubtedly an ideological one, yet personal law systems often face serious problems, as you can see in the slide. So it is not by chance that such systems have been so heavily and often acquired by the United Nations and other international organizations for their human rights implication. Just think to polygamy, to better the women, to female genital mutilation or alteration, alteration as you like. As I said before, I will synthetically report a set of instances gathered in the field, focusing on particular ethnographic context and times, rather than on ab abstract accounts. Let me start with the first case study and speak about the Indian state, which provides a particularly rich example of such a system of law. In reality, the Indian state administers different family law codes to people of different reality, uh, religious faiths. For example, a Muslim citizen will marry and divorce under laws and procedures which are different from those applied to a Hindu citizen. Just think about polygamy. Similarly, a Christian will inherit differently to a Parsi and so forth. In December 2004, during my fieldwork in Kerala, a state in the southwest of India, I had the opportunity to witness a judgment grounded on the conflicting reference to a multiplicity of existing and operating legal system of inheritance. The Hindu Section Act 1956, the Joint Family Abolition Act 1975, and the very old Marumakatayam Law, the latter still regulates 
family relationships among the Nairs, the Ezvans, and other communities living in areas which have now become part of different states. Being a matrilinear system of law, which from time regulates inheritance by descent from a common female ancestor, its precepts and norms are somewhat different from the more recent patrilinear system of inheritance in the various branches of Hindu law. Here you can see uh, how old is this uh, type of uh, law, traditional, it is a traditional law. The case of the Indian state allows me to make some useful clarifications. First of all, the positivist legal culture often uses terms such as personal law, customary law, and traditional law interchangeably. It is important to specify and state that personal law can be either, this is in Kerala, this is codified or customary or traditional or none of these. Generally, this is backwaters in Kerala, this photo. Generally, personal law is an original mixture of previous as well as innovative rules and methods of legal reasoning. Therefore, what matters for personal law is whether different laws or legal norms, whatever their form or prominence, apply to different types of people. In my second example, my research relates to the specific case of Muslim women wearing the, wearing the, we the veil. How women should dress in public is indeed an important issue in the Muslim world. There are many kinds of veil. <coughs> the burqa, the niqab, the chador, and the hijab. Since different scholars have adopted a different interpretation of the original text, the bait from both academics and the ordinary people is focusing especially on whether or not the Quran advocates a dress code for women, and if so, on how much of the female body should be covered. The most conservative religious leaders affirm that such a requirement is clearly stated by the verses, by verses 30, 31 of Surah 24, asking believing women to lower their gaze and to dress modestly. For them, these verses make the wearing of veil mandatory in public as well as in the presence of men who are not close relatives. Conversely, Many other scholars underline that, in reality, the Quran does not specifically mention the veil or tell women to wear extremely confining clothes. It only invites men and women to dress and behave modestly in society. Anyway, what I want to stress here is how persons and things, the core elements of society, are constructed by legal rituals and institutions. According to, to some historians, indeed, the veiling did not, or did not originate with the advent of Islam, but rather it was a social habit picked up with its expansion. In the past, since the Byzantine Greek and Persian Empire, elite women wore the veil as a symbol of a respectability and high status. In fact, as it was impractical for working women to wear veils, it was a marker of a differentiate between upper class women and lower class working women, slaves or prostitutes. So we see how the Islamic law has fabricated specific laws enforcing this habit, making it a very strong norm of compliance with the legal order. In this regard, it is important to specify that in Islamic culture, a concept of law as we understand it at present doesn't exist. For us, Western people use it to thinking of the law as a positive, secular, and autonomous social field, perfectly differentiated from religion, moral, truth, and policy. It is very difficult to understand Sharia Islamic law, many types of Sharia Islamic law.
Here, indeed, precepts and norms are enforcing each other in a complex sacred combination of all those social domains. My invitation is to explore the issue <coughs> comparatively to show how, even though the hijab is often seen by Westerns as a tool used by men to control and silence women as a sign of oppression and seclusion, in the Muslim world, the practice is understood differently in different contexts and by different people. During my field work in Italy as well as in Africa, I have gathered more than 100 interviews with women coming from different countries all around the world. My results show that whether it is worn by choice or force is open to debate, as very few women are able to or prefer not to voice an opinion on the matter. However, for the majority of Muslim women interviewed, to cover or not to cover should obviously be a free made choice, a personal decision. Consequently, the reason for wearing the veil varies a lot. For some women, it is a symbol of segregation, which the values women and should be banned or and regarded as discriminatory. While its religious leader justify veiling by invoking the sacred text as a foundation, it can alternatively be seen as mere interpretation by a patriarchal system trying to remain in force. For others, it is a symbol of piety and great inner strength and fortitude. Besides, it allows women to be known as respectable, avoid sexual desire, and minimize sexual harassment in the workplace. Some governments encourage and even oblige women to wear the hijab, while others have banned it in at least some public settings. <coughs> Under the Taliban's strict laws, for example, all women are required to wear burqa and the violators are punished by beating uh, or stoning. Some countries such as Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Iran and Qatar do enforce this code and even non-Muslim women must cover their heads. In Tunisia, on the contrary, after years of restrictive policies banning the veil in public places in order to promote modern secularism and the equality of women starting from 2011, women can freely choose whether to wear the hijab or not. In Turkey and Morocco, there are still some restrictions because the hijab is seen as a sign of political Islam or fundamentalism against the secular government. In Jordan, in Jordan, veiling is a personal choice, but it is widely believed that the hijab is increasingly becoming more of a fashion statement than a religious one. In Italy, mainly in accordance with Article 19, Italian Constitution, Freedom of Religion, and 21, Freedom of Thinking, veiling is allowed, generally speaking, with the exception for security reasons of the, those kinds of veil, like the burqa, which make a person's identification difficult or impossible. <coughs> or worse, can lead to an advantageous false or prejudicial identification. In several European countries, this adherence to the hijab has led to political controversies and the proposals for a legal ban. As I said before, legal bans on face covering clothing are often justified on security grounds and also as an anti-terrorist measure. Sometimes the emphasis is on the secular nature of the modern state or it is considered a sign of failed integration. Particularly in countries where the practice is discouraged or even forbidden, such as, for instance, France or Belgium, it is experienced as a sign of Islamic consciousness and of desire to be part of an Islamic revival. Recently, however, in all immigration contexts, wearing the hijab or other type of veil is becoming a way to both publicly announce one's own Islamic identity and simultaneously reject the Western values of dress and culture. <coughs> so, uh, how, how we, uh, we were speaking about before is the question of identity. 
to wear the hijab, to wear the way. In my next example, I would like to point out the Israel Lebanese case of legal pluralism. Before our colleague was speaking about that. In Lebanon, in fact, there are 17 official religions corresponding to as many recognized communities which formal actual <coughs> legal entities. Each community has its own family law and its own religious courts, which adjudicate cases. Thus, communities enjoy legislative and jurisdictional autonomy. Therefore, here we witness legislation applicable, applicable to all Lebanese, this legislation applicable to Muslims, and legislation applicable to non-Muslims. Let me give just a glimpse on this, of this on the topic of marriage. In, in case of a religious marriage, if the wedding has taken place in Lebanon, it falls under the family law of the community in which the marriage was celebrated. Until April 2013, when the first civil marriage, marriage was registered, civil marriages such as we have in Europe did not exist in Lebanon. This is the first couple who had the civil marriage. Thus, couples wanting to escape the religious dictat, dictat have a civil marriage abroad. Upon their return, the marriage is recognized, but only for non-Muslims. As a matter of fact, civil marriage abroad produces all the legal effects which are linked to it, such as civil status registration, legitimacy of children, and the rights of succession. However, certain situation, situations escape the rule of Lebanese civil law and fall again under religious jurisdiction, notably in cases of dispute inheritance. A major difficulty arises in marriages between Muslims. Although Islamic law formally recognizes the validity of civil marriage, it does not recognize its legal effect. Benefits expected from civil marriage are then neutralized by Islamic law on the basis of the Article 79 of the Code of Civil Procedure, which gives primacy to the Sharia. Legally speaking, there is no interdiction per se, but rather a somewhat legal vacuum, which in practice discourages civil marriage and therefore helps religious institutions and authorities to maintain their political and social power. Here, the marriage is clearly part of a patriarchal social structure. In a patriarchal social order, nationality, residence, belonging, rights, and religion are passed on by the father. A Lebanese, a Lebanese mother, for example, cannot pass her nationality onto her children, except in the event of their foreign father's death or if they were born illegitimate. Sharia law doesn't allow Muslim women to marry non-Muslim men. A Muslim man, instead, can marry a, only a Jewish or Christian woman, woman because he remains the head of the household and therefore can pass his own religion onto his children. So this difference can be understood, as I said before, by the logic of patriarchy. It is for this and many other reasons that the women often seek equal citizenship rights and also as whether certain laws and norms established for specific purposes and in a specific context a thousand years ago retain their relevance in changed social, political and economic circumstances. This is an issue which has been the subject of many conferences and publications. The above mentioned example underlines very well that personal law is not just any kind of law which distinguishes between people, but only law which 
distinguishes between people with different kinds of socially and politically relevant communal or kinship ties. Moreover, it also threw light on why tensions between Islamic law and human rights focus mainly on three pivotal points, marriage, inheritance, and nationality. My last example is about what we could call a sort of incorporation into the Italian legal system of one fundamental tenet of Jewish personal law. This concern concerns the important innovative rule corresponding to the Article 4 of Law 101, 1989, which regulates the relationship within the Italian state and the union of Italian Jewish communities. It explicitly gives to Jewish people and workers the rights of sabbatical leave. For this reason, the law also invites the authorities in charge of arranging the dates of a competitive examination to consider such a right. In addition, it allows Jewish students taking final exams to ask for the date of their test to be changed if it falls on Saturday. Furthermore, recently, minister, ministerial decrees 42-2011 and 13-2013 unequivocally rules out any type of test or examination of an, on a Saturday. It does not specifically mention Jewish personal law and its prescription on sabbatical leave, but I presume it is the case in point. Well, without wishing to settle all debates on the matter, my intention has been to give just some examples of the very fundamental role played by the culture in influencing legal meanings and the rules and vice versa. The awareness of this cultural aspect seems necessary to better place the role and position of law in society, particularly nowadays. The contemporary globali globalized postmodern era indeed compels us to redesign the normative scenarios that have been dominant so far. Nevertheless, the relationship between legal differences or pluralism and the cultural difference is raising many questions about the proper limits of law generally, especially state law. In this regard, my results seem confirm the anthropological assumption that cultural meanings of difference are themselves contingent. That is, the difference is a socially constructed category and its significance varies a lot across time and space. Therefore, we must be aware of the fact that official law plays everywhere a pivotal role in conceptualizing the difference and ordering what is depicted as being both inside and outside the legal system. It is not by chance that the central theoretical questions in the field of legal pluralism arise precisely from the cultural reality of state law itself. At the same time, However, we cannot disregard the fact that state law usually tends to treat cultural groups and personal law systems as monoliths, paying more attention to, the, to differences between and among legal systems than to differences within them. When religious groups pressing their own claims are patriarchal, their customs and law aim to control and subordinate women. Personal law, as we have seen, is particularly concerned with marriage, divorce, child custody, control of family property and inheritance, all social fields which have much greater impact on lives of women and girls. So, as I have attempted to illustrate, we are currently witnessing a deep and growing tension between feminism and the multiculturalist commitment to protect cultural diversity and personal law system. Just in, as I said before, to polygamy, genital female alteration, butter the women, children, bride, and so on. 
to sum up when the liberal arguments are made for the rights of religious and ethnic communities in order to attain a more inclusive and balanced understanding of equality, then special care must be taken to look at inequalities within groups. It is especially important to consider gender inequality and discrimination with substantial differences of power and advantage between men and women. Consequently, if the need for harmonization between different legal orders, mainly reshaping constitutional law and system, is becoming more and more urgent in building our social legal future, we must take seriously the need for adequate representation of women as well as of the less powerful members of minority groups conforming to the fundamental Western values of freedom, legal justice, and human rights. Okay, thank you. I finished. Thank you for the very rich presentation and uh, with the help of, uh, of the slides that uh, I hope that uh, can be made available to the members of the panel later so that uh, we can think about it. Uh, now uh, we have the uh, fourth uh, presentation by Roberto Scarciglia. As I said, he will focus in particular on methodological aspects of comparative legal research in the area of legal pluralism. Roberto, please. Uh, thanks uh, uh, so much, Roberto, for this invitation, and uh, thanks uh, uh, to the colleagues for the, the brilliant uh, relation um, before this uh, um, uh, little and, and short uh, uh, reflection about methodology and uh, legal pluralism. Um, before uh, uh, the begin, beginning, uh, my relation, I was very uh, interested to the uh, symbolic picture um, of the, um, I think, uh, um, chancellor or, or another figure in, uh, in uh, the um, slide uh, uh, by Marshall Zee. Um, that uh, suggests me uh, idea of uh, King's uh, double body by Kantorowicz and uh, idea that the, the people uh, um, we saw in these pictures uh, in, in true um, as a uh, double identity, an identity um, in relationship uh, with the states, uh, a state and uh, um, a relationship with uh, a God. So, uh, idea uh, of uh, double body is uh, really interesting in uh, a perspective uh, from uh, a political theory uh, point of view. I think it's interesting, this imagine. Because the problem of legal pluralism is also for me a problem of uh, symbolic knowledge of legal pluralism, uh, symbolic knowledge of uh, um, many uh, material facts that we saw every day uh, in our experience uh, in newspapers or uh, that uh, picture was uh, by, uh, three years ago I saw these pictures in newspaper for the sheep. So every day we have uh, symbolic pictures imagined. Uh, that's all, and the uh, idea uh, um, of double body, of um, King's double body, is interesting for me to introduce uh, um, one of uh, uh, three, uh, four um, aspects of uh, a little short introduction to um, analyze uh, um, methodological pluralism, not only methodology. And I think the role of a comparatist in this moment is really important. I try to demonstrate 
that uh, uh, begin a new uh, phase of investigation and uh, analyzing for analyzing these uh, um, very complicated processes. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, is uh, an idea that uh, um, debate uh, on legal pluralism um, has in common uh, with many debates uh, on uh, um, globalized, different forms of globalization uh, to try to um, prospect uh, some classification. For example, the resistance uh, to uh, one law, to resistance to a global effect, resistance, uh, defense, uh, or acceptation or production of rules which uh, could produce a globalization or could produce other forms of pluralism. It's really interesting. This classification for some aspects are, um, has a, an intersection in common. But this is preliminary remarks. Um, and also, and also um, when we speak uh, about uh, legal pluralism uh, and uh, also globalization, we speak about not only um, about norms or judges, but we speak um, about different actors. And so, which is the place of the personal um, uh, law or uh, uh, a role of one people in this system. And um, for example, in uh, all the but about pluralism, but also, uh, also in uh, um, in globalization, use three words, uh, and that for me uh, um, are I I interesting. Uh, the first one, uh, the first one is Michaels, or Ralph Michaels, to say, extensity, intensity, velocity. So we are get not used to about this perspective. Uh, if we imagine uh, a classical professor of a constitutional law that has uh, get used uh, to study normativism uh, and uh, uh, to uh, discuss about uh, uh, judgment of a constitutional courts, in this moment as uh, a very fast process to confuse uh, the classical uh, categories of law. And uh, uh, from a Nordic experience, uh, uh, one could say, where is the throne of law? What is law in this moment? Because, for example, some uh, categories of law are in discussion. First one, uh, preliminary, is methodology. Uh, I think this, uh, Trento is the, the, the place uh, very special for methodology because it was a, a manifest of Common Core some years ago. And uh, um, it's very important to say, yeah, uh, this, uh, to make this reflection in this place. And, uh, for example, uh, the, the study of 70 uh, years, until 70 years, uh, was for us uh, the, rule, the principal rules for interpretation in constitutional law or in comparative law in, in general. And I know that the, um, we have to ask to ourselves, if the instruments, methodological instruments uh, uh, that we use in this moment, or we don't use, many people not, don't use this instrument, are useful to analyze this about, about legal pluralism. On, uh, not only, but uh, if the results of our analysis are effective or not. Because uh, we, you, uh, we say, uh, I make a an comparative analysis, but uh, by which instrument? Uh, for example, I, 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 I say a short, uh, uh, very short, uh, uh, what is the problem in uh, our group of research? Because uh, it's very important today to, to meet colleagues and uh, um, could have uh, an uh, interdisciplinary uh, perspective about our work. And uh, for example, uh, 
the, the, it's very, 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 uh, very interesting to say that uh, in some parts of the world, so some, pe uh, some people, some scholars, uh, try to investigation if it's possible to um, work about new form of use methodology. Uh, an example, we, we, we speak about, uh, about uh, um, Islamic or uh, the Muslim perspective and also Indian perspective. And uh, one example for uh, this uh, new idea uh, to have a conception of methodology is the kite model of Werner Meski, for example. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, in, in which uh, uh, there is not only the formal systems, formal rules, but exists a part that is possible to say um, by uh, Michel Polanyi a tacit dim dimension. It's not possible to discuss about uh, the classical uh, law in the books, a law in action, that is very, very old. It's not possible because there is a dimension that uh, um, is not uh, visible. The, the comparatists must try to investigate in another dimension. For example, uh, I don't see Carlo Casonato is there. It's very important, uh, the, the studies of Carlo for uh, our perspective. And uh, for example, uh, another, another point of view in, uh, in, uh, uh, method from a methodological point of view is to uh, to try to experiment not only horizontal comparison, but vertical comparison. Uh, comparison between different level of norms, different level of rules, different level of actors. And uh, um, uh, some scholars speak about cross comparison, comparison uh, by different uh, methodologies. It's necessary to try perhaps different methodologies. And uh, um, for example, when uh, um, Werner Meski uh, describes uh, the system of different rules in England or in, in, uh, in, in Great Britain, because there is also Wales, and uh, um, he say that uh, it's not uh, Sharia, only Sharia, only uh, Islamic or the Muslim. He had uh, uh, invented a, wor a word, a very interesting, and he say that there is uh, an uh, ungrazy Sharia. So in the Sharia plus other things. Sharia, different forms of Sharia, different forms of rule. Roberto uh, told before two words, but in this sense, before in the last conclusion. And uh, um, perhaps uh, there is an invisible uh, places. Uh, he, sp he speaks about uh, shadow, the shadow. No, uh, there is a life. There is uh, there are rules. Not only we speak at, uh, we speak about uh, Sharia or we speak about. Uh, positive norms, but they um, uh, could say, or one could say, uh, that there is also um, uh, forms of urf, of, of customs, very important. This is not only Sharia, but also customs, many customs in a very, very um, complicated cross of uh, uh, traditions of uh, cultural uh, position uh, in, the, in England and in Great Britain. And so when we speak about uh, Sharia Council, we speak about judges who give different interpretation of Sharia, give different interpretation of um, source of law. And uh, uh, this product of, of other uh, uh, legal reflection um, give to us a perspective uh, very, uh, uh, very difficult to understand for me. It's, it's only uh, for me, but the first one, 
uh, the classical system of source of law is not the same. Because uh, if we, we imagine a pluralism about, uh, uh, for example, uh, a pluralism um, with many actors, different actors in different level, for that I spoke about uh, vertical comparison, it's possible to have the rule of the father in a family and the rule of the international organization, the rule about the banking, uh, economic uh, rule, for example, uh, for uh, Islamic finance, for Islamic financiation, for family um, uh, accommodation, mediation, integration, or to discover um, voluntary rules. We saw also in the system of, of civil law, is it possible with the willingness to, to, to make something different, to have different uh, civil court, if, to, different uh, uh, forms, uh, forms to realize uh, one interest. And so, uh, for example, uh, it's difficult for me from a comparative law perspective, speak about uh, uh, hierarchy of norms. Also, Roberto speaks, uh, which is the uh, way, the best way to resolve antinomies. We are classical, we have our uh, constitutional court that give an interpretation. We get used to uh, l'axon of a French Revolution say, before. But uh, this idea, this uh, so uh, idea, the extensity, intensity, and velocity, uh, 10 years ago, the role of uh, web is very different. In this moment, it's possible one man could uh, uh, invent it that the uh, rule of, of Koran uh, must be interpreted in a, a sense another one in another sense. So there is a confusion. It was inter not only confusion of norms, because it's difficult. We are get used to confront the norms and the values. But uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to, um, uh, to know which is the authorized uh, people, authorized uh, subject, who or which gives a correct interpretation, authorities of interpretation. Because uh, when we have different, many interpretation, and Sharia courts in, in, in Great Britain give different interpretation, because all depends on judges. We spoke about in, in the past that the administrative tribunals give different interpretation, geographical, uh, geographical, um, culture uh, could, decide, could decide one interpretation or other interpretation. And so this one is a very important, uh, uh, for example, um, a step, topic for us. We have to begin to reflect, to reflect another time about interpretation. Interpretation of norms, interpretation rule, interpretation of interpretation. Interpretation is really really um, important to analyze different way to, uh, 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 different way for interpretation. For example, I remember the old rule that a comparatist must uh, interpret a rule uh, following the way of interpreting of this country. That was uh, classical, uh, um, uh, classical, uh, process of uh, methodologic process, Gustavo Constantinescu, no? But, for example, um, Mesky says we have different uh, type, different kinds of norms. And it's very difficult to make a classification of norms. He try, we try to make classification. And uh, it's very, very important for me today, but I think for us, to have from this colleague Classification, it's very difficult. Classification is not to make books. Classification is uh, uh, ground, is, uh, uh, is blood, it's uh, very difficult um, because before there is an interpretation. 
And uh, perhaps uh, this form of interpretation that, uh, or, or classification um, have necessary a fight uh, with uh, legal centralism. Yeah, I think Roberto spoke about the uh, hard uh, pluralism or soft pluralism, the, the thinking by Griffiths. And that one, for example, um, coming in, in uh, thinking about Bernameski, the um, four kinds of law, natural law, social legal norms, because we discuss about pluralism, social legal norms are important. Uh, in India or in, 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 for Hindu law, for uh, African law, customary law, is important. In our first lesson of public law, we say, there is a difference between uh, formal law and the social legal norms. And the best uh, in all, all of these books. But it's not so, no? If we, we want to discuss uh, our transmigration from, from uh, uh, Westphalia to Eastphalia, they say so in, in, in these ways. And um, we have, to, we have uh, from this point of view, two choices, B to and B, virtual comparties, virtual comparties or comparties. Because uh, um, the velocity of information uh, is very, um, for me, very problematic. Too much. And in too much, there is a theory of information um, it's not possible to analyze this form. There is legal positivism, the third one, and uh, clearly, uh, I know the, in, this play, in this moment, very, very soon, a, a paper about the trap of legal positivism, for example, because um, if it's not possible for me to separate, I say there is a central, uh, legal centralism. Win only legal centralism. And so the rule that uh, I let that rule of another people come in my country, I will or not. And so it's not possible to discuss in, in, uh, in uh, um, vertical uh, forms of comparison by um, this perspective. And perhaps, and international norms. In this moment, uh, this is, I think, a role for Compartis that international, we speak about international constitutional law, uh, uh, which is the values of international law which uh, uh, are uh, so important for the constitution of the states. Uh, I have an idea, for example, when, when uh, uh, these problems come to me to um, uh, for, 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 to, um, for an analysis that I think to this uh, fantastic uh, 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 story, um, uh, The Mask of, uh, Dead, uh, of Red Death by Conan Doyle, in which there is a castle with all the people uh, are very quiet with all, and uh, one night comes a, a, beautiful, uh, a beautiful woman with red, a uh, red book, uh, quasi. And uh, uh, that was the, 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 uh, the red debt. And so uh, the system was, uh, was uh, um, uh, uh, mixed. In one moment uh, was the panic in, in, in this hour. And the same is, uh, for example, in another literary uh, example, uh, in, uh, um, in Canton Mountain, perhaps, in which uh, the war uh, uh, get to this fantastic uh, hotel uh, in, in uh, Switzerland that all the people uh, must go away because this is a war. So in this moment, legal pluralism or legal pluralism are uh, for me the same effects of this literary history, this literary description. And uh, um, for example, another, uh, there is another element uh, um, uh, in uh, 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 with, uh, uh, with that, uh, we have to must uh, um, uh, have a relationship, and, and, and there is the Human Rights Act. When we have a Human Rights Act, we have a new form to see this uh, phenomena, and, uh, and, uh, and that one is necessary not only for the court, 
uh, European courts, because we have to, to describe which is the intersection of legal pluralism uh, that we import uh, in, uh, in uh, our uh, thinking, in our way of thinking, which is the, the factors uh, that is possible to have uh, in, uh, in a kaleidoscope of uh, plurality, uh, in a kaleidoscope of legal pluralism. Uh, I, I like very much this image of a kaleidoscope. And uh, perhaps um, what is important in this, uh, in this perspective of human rights um, idea that uh, Griffith's idea that uh, legal pluralism are in conflict, are in quasi impermanent conflict, intention or in intention. And uh, another reflection that Roberto uh, said before, uh, he spoke about uh, uh, Europeanization of Islam or European Islam. It's not possible to leave this element um, away from our debate because we have to imagine in Europe, we make in, in other investigation, that we have young people, the other generation of Islamic people who lives in Europe, who wants to uh, work in respect of tradition. And uh, uh, the need of integration is very, very clear because, uh, for example, that phenomenon is not only for uh, Muslim people. I think that uh, in, uh, in England and Wales, uh, there are two, um, uh, two million uh, seven thousand uh, Muslims. And perhaps uh, in this moment, uh, 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 the Muslim religion is uh, one of the most important globalization and demonstrate uh, that we, we, uh, we say trust frontier uh, mobility of law. Uh, in this case, transfrontier mobility of religious law. And I think that one is a, a big revolution, and we have no, no instruments. We discuss about interpretation of a rules in a court, but we have a big, very big, very complex phenomenon in, uh, uh, in legal perspective. And uh, I'm very, um, very like to see that today we have anthropologists, uh, uh, we have uh, sociologists, uh, different perspective, because it's impossible for a lawyer, for a compartist lawyer to, um, uh, to fight these uh, difficulties uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a legal perspective. It's not only Europe. And, uh, um, for example, the last, uh, I won't finish but for, for discussion, interpretation of courts. We discuss in, in, uh, in our, um, in our uh, paper uh, about dialogue between courts. Which dialogue? At a restaurant or which dialogue? As, if, as it's easy, it's useful that the judges dialogue uh, together in a, in a big conference, not in a strong seminar, uh, our interventors, I like very much. And uh, about perhaps this sentence, uh, not this sentence, it's very, very different because, for example, we have an, an, in, Jewish, uh, in uh, Jewish law, for example, uh, a decision about divorce, a decision about family uh, could be um, have a different interpretation for different judges, religious judges, civil judges. And uh, we ask, um, which are the relationship between different judges? A rabbinic tribunal, tribunal and, uh, for example, constitutional court. <laughs> uh, there are the rule, which kind uh, of norms uh, could uh, um, Real the relationship because uh, it's, that one is very, very, very uh, important to, um, uh, to say that we have an intersection. I like very much to discuss about uh, sets, 
or the fuzzy logic, but sets and uh, uh, to, to, to find what, uh, um, what we have uh, uh, in common, two different sets have in common, an intersection set. And uh, uh, legal pluralism has in, in, uh, uh, could invite you to discuss, to, to, to find uh, a lot of time. And uh, uh, when uh, in England, in Great Britain, discuss how it's possible to uh, develop our Muslim rules. Because we say European uh, uh, Islamization, but uh, there is another position, Islamization of Europe. And uh, uh, for example, Meski uh, uh, speaks about uh, a tactic. We make a school, the first school, the secondary school, university, uh, um, all the people uh, in, uh, in, uh, in SOAS uh, in London knows that the uh, Arabic Emirates um, had uh, uh, built the, uh, and give a lot of money to the universities. And so this is uh, the, the last element of my very short and incomplete abstract analysis, legal education, legal education. And uh, for that, I think uh, that we have a very important role, legal education. Uh, every people must ask, uh, every year, which concept of integration, which concept of difference, which concept of multicultural dimension I transfer to my students every year. And uh, for example, when we build, uh, it's not a discussion only for pollution. We uh, educated the, the young people to respect uh, uh, the trees. We have to respect the values, respect the customs. Uh, and uh, there are many forms to respect, to teach. And so I think it's possible to begin uh, new forms of reflection about difference. Difference is a part of our teaching. And uh, I think that uh, many people in different uh, uh, law, sociology, uh, and uh, anthropology, language, uh, for example, uh, uh, our colleagues speak about uh, the Moroccan code. But it's very interesting to read the translation of a Moroccan code in French and in Spanish. They, they uh, produce two different imagine of women. French is very similar to our model, Spanish is not. Translation, I invite the people, because the French translations were very fast, Spanish translation, one year of work. So it's different, you know, translation language. So I think, and uh, uh, I go to finish, if, we, uh, if we, we want to discover this uh, unofficial realm, if we want to discover that uh, we are today comparatist, perhaps uh, necessary to uh, begin uh, um, by teaching this concept. And, uh, I think the best condition uh, to analyze a dynamic world, not a static world. That's all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think it will be fascinating for the discussants to take into consideration all the aspects of the papers that have been uh, presented today, in particular of the last one. Now, is there, as we did with the first session, is there any quick question that uh, deserves a quick answer mm -hmm. before we, we break? No quick question, no quick answer? Uh, I have a question which which cannot be answered in a quick way. So, I just, mm -hmm. now it, it so seems to me from, from what uh, has been said, 
that uh, according to, to Roberto Scarciglia, uh, a legal system has to renounce being a principle of order, which I think is the typical inherent uh, task of a legal uh, order, to be a principle of order. And the question then would be, the principle of order that we are accustomed with is founded upon hierarchy. But we are experiencing, and it's not, I think, by coincidence that you mentioned judicial dialogue, we are experiencing uh, the coexistence of a number of legal systems which uh, cannot afford being rooted in a principle of hierarchy, and this is within the European Union. And this is why there is so wide and, uh, and uh, uh, a repeated uh, uh, need for judicial dialogue. Now, you have been a little bit ironic about judicial dialogue. Uh, of course, I, I share view, your view insofar as irony takes into consideration the fact that scholars more than judges have been labeling everything as judicial dialogue. So I would totally agree that we should know what is judicial dialogue properly. But by all means, judicial dialogue has been the device through which we could avoid clashes between legal systems which do not have a principle of order as their foundation. And then I think it is even more appropriate, allow me to repeat again this quotation by Griffith which I gave earlier when he said, let me just give a moment. The technique of governance yes. and pragmatic grounds. Yes, exactly, because yeah. So in other words, we are to, to such an extent unable to elaborate a theory of jurisdiction, to elaborate a theory of law, to elaborate a theory of interpretation that we can only rely on pragmatic devices, uh, that we have to give up any systematic construction based on a principle of order. Now, of course, all this can have very different uh, results, uh, which might even include anarchy, uh, not anarchy as a colloquial uh, uh, asset, but as uh, something which is, uh, I would say, formally established as anarchy. Uh, are we to imply that globalization takes anarchy with it? So I, I said these are not questions that may have a quick answer. Uh, of course, if you want just to make yeah. a quick, I see you're ready, so. Uh, uh, I'm ready, yes. uh, Okay, so, but I, I <laughs> I think that we have to take all this up again in the afternoon because uh, we are really talking about the future of, yes. of, of legal systems. Just three systems. minutes. Huh? Just three and minutes. Uh, at the same time, we found, and this is almost paradoxical, that in fact we had the legal anthropologist supporting universal values over diversity. <laughs> so I wonder from this point of view, whether you are not somehow um, uh, conditioned by some sort of uh, militant feminism, which of course might be the case, and I'm not saying that there is anything wrong about it, but then my question is, would you make only one exception in your assertiveness of, university, of universal values over diversities would it be only the status of woman or something else? Mm -hmm. Because in the first case, I'm afraid it would be too militant a militantism. Huh? Militancy. Polit politicians, yeah, militarization. Yeah. So the point is, are we just restricting not all of human rights, but only uh, the, the, the role of the woman? Or shall we say the role of the woman and uh, uh, protection of life? And then, of course, how do you define life? How do you 
protect life. So uh, it, it is uh, really when when we think of anthropologists, we find anthropologists giving justification for all the odd behaviors. Uh, <laughs> whatever you don't. Yes, you know, so, yes. So Sometimes. That, that okay. Of yes. course, Sometimes. I'm oversimplifying. Yes, yes. Fine, yeah? mm -hmm. But I, I found it very, very interesting, and I wonder if we can take up such topics again in the afternoon. But now we must leave uh, Roberto a chance of giving a quick answer, almost a joke. <laughs> no, well, just what we mean it. Oh, I, didn't I make, uh, you have no uh, paper, but it's uh, similar. First one, it's impossible for uh, a lawyer to be anarchist. First one. That's the point, yes. It's impossible. Yeah. But it's possible for a lawyer or for a comparatist to open, uh, to open sense. And so it's not important that we have in common a word. It's necessary for me to have in common a little point, A, B, or two different sets. If we have an intersection X, it's possible that from this point of view, we can recognize common elements of European citizenship, a package, little package of citizenship for all. It's not in discussion the values, constitutional values. It's impossible. So the discussion. area X would be European Islam? That yeah, yes, yeah. could be. Or, uh, or uh, Indian and Islam, or yeah, well, Catholic. Course, yes, yes. Just a little bit. For example, this is possible in the towns. When they decide in a cemetery to give uh, orientation to La Mecca, for example. We decide with our little rule to give possibility. Is it possible, for example, in two different schools when we decide to give a multicultural food, food before, and to try because food, literature, music, many things give the idea. Yes, but your right not to eat pork is, con is inconsistent with my right to, uh, to, to eat uh, kaiserfleisch. It's better for me not to eat uh, in absolute. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm sorry and, uh, I didn't want no, to. No, eat. no, no, true. But uh, like that's uh, not possible because uh, I think that uh, we, have, um, we must have idea and uh, also my friend, uh, ultra-positivist, when constitutional courts, the first part of constitution is in safe, they have the lenses, they have a um, glass to see the world. It's possible. It's not possible to give a restaurant with tablet. Because tablet, I make all my affairs. I, I must to see the people. Uh, must to teach abroad, to know the people. It's very different, the experience, to know the people. Because uh, I think that in many papers, I've read a lot, of many, uh, a lot of papers, in many papers we describe reality not corresponding to reality. Imaginary words. Because it's not possible uh, to describe only a description, but everybody could describe uh, how a word uh, to see different images. If I am here, you are here, we have a different poem on this column. And so the idea is to have a common, because common is not uh, um, uniformization, but is integration. It's not uh, uh, to say that, like, Uniformization, that is the two words in, in, in law, we have many of double vision. Uh, uniformization or integration. I think that we are in a world that a invisible integration come, comes every day. Invisible integration, invisible integration. And why not? We don't... Uh, let that is the integration, invisible integration, could uh, uh, be discussed, for example, for be analyzed. So interpret different interpretation, different school, Quranic school. Uh, for example, uh, for me is important the customs, Urf, because uh, 
uh, they transmit me a, a piece of history. When uh, I speak about uh, uh, judge di dialogues, um, and uh, I saw the books, it's more important that the scholars speak. Uh, the dialogue is scholars, uh, you told perfect, a scholar and judges. Because uh, the judges are not get used to use the ideas of other people. A French, uh, when we discuss about law beyond the state, it's impossible that a Frenchman and an Englishman uh, could see the, the, this column in the same way. And we are in Europe, and the, 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 the place, geographical place of important revolution for the world. And uh, perhaps uh, the last one, uh, this process is not easy. This process to find intersection is so complicated, but is not fast. It's slow. When you speak about the transformation of the, the woman in, uh, for example, in Asia, uh, Asian colleagues say, but our transformation has law, has law. Is, so, also our transformation uh, is slow because we have to change mentality. We have to change our usual way of thinking and come from Westphalia to Westphalia. Now, of course, we have a prime minister which makes us run. Perhaps. Don't we? Okay. I wait for. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, thank okay. you very much, and uh, I think we ought to have a break now. And we start at, uh, at I, I thought at two, but perhaps it's going to be a quarter past two. Very good. Okay, very good. Very good.